Hello, my name is Jeff Hyatt and I'm a lecturer at the University of Leeds and today I want to talk about bonding and more specifically the question I want to deal with is what type of bonding is present in a crystal of aluminium oxide? Is it ionic, covalent or both? And how do we know? I quite like this question because of that third option, is ionic, covalent or both? It recognises, as we all should, that ionic and covalent represent just two extremes of bonding which are rarely found in their ideal form. In reality, most bonds have some degree of intermediate character. So a covalent bond in the ideal form would have a pair of electrons equally shared between two atoms. As we move away from that ideal, we would have a situation where the electrons are not shared evenly and have one atom having a slightly negative charge and the other a slight positive. And that is, of course, the polar covalent bond, and it has a degree of ionic character. In contrast, the perfect ionic bond occurs when you get complete transfer of electrons from one atom to another to form negative and positive ions, which are then attracted to each other, forming the ionic bond. However, as we move away from that ideal, the positive ion can distort or polarise the electron cloud of the anion, pulling electrons back towards itself and introducing a degree of covalency. If we return now to aluminium oxide, we might ask, is there any way if we can tell if it is ionic or covalent by considering its macroscopic properties, the melting point, the solubility, the conductivity, those properties that we can investigate and measure in the laboratory. Well, aluminium oxide, or alumina, as it's sometimes known, is a white solid with an extremely high melting point in excess of 2,000 degrees, and it's insoluble. A-level textbooks often introduce the different types of bonding by listing their properties. So ionic compounds are soluble in water and have high melting points, while covalent compounds have low melting points and are insoluble. So alumina, with its high melting point and low solubility, matches neither of these simple descriptions. These are useful rules of thumb to correlate bonding with properties, but they certainly aren't definitive, and numerous exceptions are known. So for example, we have silicon dioxide. This is a covalent compound, which has a very high melting point, and we also have covalent compounds like methanol, ethanol, and ammonia, which are all soluble. Ionic compounds can also be insoluble, for example, calcium and barium carbonate. And we now also know of ionic liquids, which as their name implies, have such low melting points they're liquid at room temperature, and yet still contain ions. As such, the macroscopic properties are insufficient indicators for definitively stating the nature of the bonds present. Instead, we must consider the microscopic properties, the properties of the atoms themselves, which makes sense because, after all, the chemical bond is an interaction between atoms and their electrons. The relevant property is electronegativity. This was a concept developed by the American chemist, Linus Pauling, and it's a measure of the ability of an atom to draw a pair of electrons towards itself in a bond. When two elements combine and we have a large electronegative difference, like in cesium and fluorine, for example, then an ionic bond is formed. And if the electronegativity difference is small, or if the values are identical, as when the atoms of fluorine combine in elemental fluorine, a covalent bond is formed. This simple interpretation, however, is flawed, as can be highlighted by considering the case of the bond formed between the atoms in elemental cesium in group 1. Here there's only one type of atom, and so obviously the electronegativity difference is again zero, but cesium is a metal and has metallic bonds, not covalent bonds. So we actually have three types of interaction, the covalent, ionic and metallic, representing the most extreme examples of a single entity, the chemical bond. In order to distinguish these three, we must consider not only the difference in electronegativity, but also the average value of the two electronegativities. By plotting the average electronegativity against the difference in electronegativity for a range of atom pairs, we get a triangular diagram called the arcel kettler triangle, in which different types of bonds can be correlated to the values obtained from the electronegativities. At the top of the diagram, we have ionic bonds. When there is a large difference in electronegativity, for example, in the bond formed between cesium and fluorine, in the bottom right of the diagram, we have covalent bonds, where there is a small difference in electronegativity, but a large average value. For example, the bond formed between two fluorine atoms. Finally, in the bottom left, when we have a small difference, but a low average value, so that the electrons are evenly shared, but weakly held, so that they can delocalise, we have the metallic bond. Although this diagram is drawn with sharp boundaries between the different bond types, idealised forms of ionic, covalent and metallic bonding will only be found at the corners of that diagram with some degree of intermediate behaviour, like polar covalent or polarised ionic bonds nearer the dividing lines. Finally, this leads us to being able to locate aluminium oxide on the Kettler triangle. 
aluminium has an electronegativity of 1.61, while oxygen has a value of 3.44. This gives an average of 2.53 and a difference of 1.83. Plotting these values on the triangle places it in the ionic portion of the arcol ketalide diagram, but very close to the covalent border. This makes sense because ionic aluminium oxide would contain aluminium 3 plus ions, which have a very large charge density and will be polarizing, drawing the electron density back from the oxide ions towards itself and giving polarized ionic bonds. So in conclusion, and answering the question, it would be better to describe the bonding in aluminium oxide as ionic, but with a significant degree of covalency due to the polarizing power of the aluminium 3 plus ion. And we can determine this by considering the electronegativity values and using them to locate the interaction in the arcol ketalide triangle.